Hi guys, it's been a while since we talked about chemistry, so let's hop right into it with the discussion about phosphate. Phosphate, which is PO4, that's one atom of phosphorus and four atoms of oxygen, is an essential trace compound in reef aquariums that's used in protein synthesis. Trace elements like phosphorus are found in very small quantities, so all the different trace elements combined make up less than 1% of the elements in seawater. In the ocean, the level of phosphate present kind of varies, but in general it's less than 0.05 parts per million. In an aquarium, phosphate levels can get high, and that opens the door for potential problems. The three biggest problems one can face from high phosphates are, first, algae blooms. Lack of phosphate in the water is one of the bottlenecks of algae growth. Remember, in the wild it's less than 0.05 parts per million. When phosphate levels rise, algae can grow out of control. Second, coral appearance. High phosphate can cause browning of corals as it promotes the proliferation of zooxanthellae, which typically is more brown in color. Now, I've had high phosphates in my tanks, and for the most part, my corals looked fine, I thought. But in reality, they were doing well in spite of the phosphate levels and not so much because of it. When I was able to lower the phosphate level, even slightly, uh, they became much more colorful, the corals, I mean. Third, phosphate can directly inhibit calcification. And this is a big problem if you're like me and you're trying to grow lots of stony corals. The mechanism of action is not perfectly understood, but there's a few studies that have shown that the presence of high phosphate in the wild slows down coral growth. Before we get too far, we should talk about the two types of phosphates in home aquariums. There's organic and there's inorganic phosphate. So starting with inorganic, this is the bad stuff that we were just talking about. It's the stuff that's taken up by algae and prevents calcification of corals. Luckily, it can be tested for easily. Later in this video, I'll quickly go over one of the test kits that we use. The second variety is the organic, and unfortunately that is very difficult to test for because there's a bunch of different molecules that incorporate phosphate, such as ATP, that's adenosine triphosphate, which, if you recall from high school chemistry, is a fundamental piece of glycolysis. And there's DNA, which is deoxyribonucleic acid, which is the molecule responsible for genetic information in cellular reproduction. So there's all kinds of these types of compounds. There's also like phospholipids and proteins with prominent phosphorus groups. Now, even though we can't really test for those very easily, we still care about organic phosphate because they can be converted to inorganic phosphate and that can lead to all those issues that we were just talking about. Luckily, one of the things that distinguishes organic from inorganic phosphate in a practical sense, is that organic phosphate can be skimmed out of a tank pretty easily by a protein skimmer. Um, a few months ago, if you recall from our protein skimmer video, they're designed to remove dissolved organic compounds to clean the water. Well, organic phosphates are exactly the kind of thing that the protein skimmer was intended to remove. So now that we've gone over what phosphate is and what effect it has on the reef tank, how exactly is phosphate introduced into the aquarium? There's two main ways that phosphate can get there. The first and most likely way, it's in the types of foods that we feed. Just about every kind of dry or frozen food is going to be high in phosphate. The best way to combat this is to use foods that essentially make it into the animals and isn't left for algae to consume. We at Tidal Gardens use a very messy cloud of frozen food, which is probably the reason why we have elevated phosphate levels. The second way that phosphate will get into an aquarium is the water itself. So it's a good idea to periodically test the water supply and also freshly mix salt water to see if either the, the source water or the salt mix is contributing to higher than desirable phosphate levels. Let's do a quick test. 
In the past chemistry videos, we used those Salifert titration test kits, and you can use their kit to test phosphate, but we tend to use these little green eggs from Hannah. They're battery operated, and if you need to replace the battery, you can do so by unscrewing this little thing at the bottom here, and then remove the plate. It's important to note that there's this connector right there, so you want to pull the plastic base straight out so you don't damage that connector. It's kind of impossible to know that until you finally remove it. Toss in the battery, and you're ready to go. Then let's get the sample, fill it up to that line there. All right, so fire up the egg, and you'll see that it says C1. That means put the sample in so that it can get a reading of just the water by itself. After that, it's going to ask for C2. So that's when we add the reagent powder to the sample and hit the button again. And for whatever reason, that reagent powder pack is not exactly the easiest thing to pour in there. It's, I call it a little bit of a design flaw. After you get all done with that, it will start a three minute timer and then give you a final reading. Whoa, that's high. Now that we know that the phosphate is high, what can we do about it? There's actually a lot of different potential solutions to this problem. The first group of solutions all revolve around nutrient export, and by ramping up nutrient export, you slowly remove the phosphate. So the first thing you can try is to dial up the protein skimmer so it takes out more skimmate. As we discussed earlier, organic phosphate can be skimmed out pretty easily and that's significant because it limits how much gets converted into inorganic phosphate, which really causes all the problems. Unfortunately, it's not really possible to skim out inorganic phosphate directly. The second option is sort of related to protein skimming, and that's carbon dosing. Carbon dosing really deserves its own video in the future, but the idea is by providing a carbon source as food, it encourages the proliferation of a certain type of bacteria that consumes nitrate and phosphate from the water. This bacteria in turn is directly removed from the system by the protein skimmer and thus lowers the level of both phosphate and nitrate. A third option is to employ macroalgae in a refugium. Nuisance algae is not the only thing that loves phosphates, Decorative macroalgae also likes it. By periodically pruning the macroalgae in refugium, it acts as a nutrient export mechanism. Lastly, there's always the good old-fashioned water change. In addition to lowering phosphate, it fixes a whole bunch of other potential problems you might be having. Obviously, I'm a big fan. Those are four possibilities as far as nutrient export goes. If those aren't working for you for some reason, there are chemical filtration methods that attack the problem more directly. The first chemical filtration method is to use a binder, such as granular ferric oxide, which bonds to the phosphate. If you decide to use GFO, make sure that you use the appropriate amount because it's entirely possible to overstrip the water using it. When in doubt, use less of this stuff than you think you need and test more often. As much of a big deal as that we're making about phosphate, the problems caused by phosphate pale in comparison to overdosing on GFO. You can absolutely wipe out your tank with GFO, trust me on that. Another way to chemically remove phosphate is by dripping Kalkwasser or calcium hydroxide. Typically, folks in the hobby use calcium hydroxide to boost calcium and alkalinity for stony coral growth but it has the added benefit of binding up phosphate and precipitate it out in the form of calcium phosphate, thus making it unavailable to do all those nasty things like grow algae or to stop stony coral growth. Okay, that sums up my thoughts on phosphate. Hopefully this video helps you guys. Questions or comments are welcome, of course, and don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. As always, happy reefing.